preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Bill Hyman, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the 92nd Street Y and co-chairman of the Education Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this second evening of our series in pursuit of human rights. Last Sunday evening, we heard a stimulating and thoughtful presentation from William F. Buckley, Jr. This evening, our guest is Anthony Lewis, who will participate in a moderated discussion conducted by Judge Marvin Frankel. When you entered the hall, among the items you were given was an index card. Following the moderated conversation, members of the audience will have the opportunity to submit, to submit written questions to Mr. Lewis and Judge Frankel. Therefore, during the first hour, if you so desire, please write your questions on the index cards and pass them to the aisles, where they will be collected by ushers who will bring them backstage. Conducting and participating in the discussion this evening is Judge Marvin Frankel. Born in New York City, Judge Frankel graduated from Columbia Law School, where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. He spent the following eight years in government service, chiefly as an assistant to the Solicitor General, briefing and arguing cases before the Supreme Court. After six more years in private practice, he became a professor at Columbia Law School. Three years later, in 1965, Marvin Frankel was appointed a judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, where he served with distinction for 13 years before returning to private practice. Currently, Judge Frankel is a senior partner in Proskauer Rose Getz and Mendelssohn. He is a prolific author and a member of the board of directors of Helsinki Watch, the American agency which seeks to monitor compliance with the Helsinki Accords. Anthony Lewis is the author of a bi-weekly column in the New York Times and a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Born in New York City, he graduated from Harvard College and immediately joined the staff of the Times. Several years later, he left to join the Washington Daily News, where in 1955 he won his first Pulitzer Prize for a series of articles on the dismissal of a Navy employee as a security risk. The articles led to the employee's reinstatement and later became the basis for a movie, Three Brave Men. Returning to the Washington Bureau of the Times, Mr. Lewis concentrated his coverage on the Supreme Court, for which efforts he won his second Pulitzer Prize in 1963. From 1965 to 1972, he headed the Times London Bureau. Currently, Mr. Lewis is teaching as a lecturer at Harvard Law School while continuing his column. Mr. Lewis is considered an expert on the constitutional rights and duties of the press. He is the author of Gideon's Trumpet, dealing with a landmark Supreme Court decision, and Portrait of a Decade, a book about changes in American race relations. But perhaps most important to us tonight, to our knowledge, no columnist in the United States has devoted more columns to human rights issues throughout the world than Anthony Lewis. It is with pleasure that I ask you to join me in welcoming to the 92nd Street Y, Judge Marvin Frankel and Anthony Lewis. Good evening. As, as Mr. Hyman said, our subject is, uh, is human rights. He also said that I spent three years as a teacher, uh, which is a short time, but is a deeply infecting kind of experience. So first, I want to be pedantic and define our terms for a minute. And pretty soon, I'll let you hear Mr. Lewis, for whom you came tonight. I think our subject, uh, accurately is international human rights. And that is a kind of special and new subject in the international scene. It's a conception that one country, uh, like the United States, or its people, or its journalists, uh, in some way have the right or privilege to look behind the borders of some other country, like the Soviet Union, or Salvador, or Canada, or Israel, or any, and complain or comment about how that second country treats or allegedly mistreats people within its borders. That, as I say, is a pretty new thing under the sun, and by no means an undisputed thing. Uh, Tony Lewis and I are not uh, exactly going to debate with each other tonight. 
Uh, I will just put him uh, some questions, some of which I hope will be intelligent and he'll speak about them. But in one sense, as I was reminded a few minutes ago, he will, I think, uh, be debating uh, with William Buckley, who spoke here last week and whom many of you heard. And I think Mr. Buckley expressed a skeptical view about this business of international human rights. I've written down a quotation that I think he must have read to you from former, former Senator Fulbright when the senator said, insofar as a nation is content to practice its doctrines within its own frontiers, that nation, however repugnant its ideology, is one with which we have no proper quarrel. Now, lots of people who believe in international human rights uh, think we do have some kind of proper quarrel uh, about how other countries behave uh, within their own borders with respect to their own people. And Mr. Lewis, as you know, is one of those people. He has ranged around the world in his writings from the Soviet Union to Central America to Israel, observing things that he thought uh, were open to criticism in respect of this subject. Uh, this past week, I think everybody in this room uh, probably applauded a wonderful column he wrote about Anatoly Sharansky complaining about how he's being treated uh, and his life endangered within the Soviet Union. At other times, he has written about other places, uh, and uh, there's undoubtedly disagreement in this room about some of those writings, and we'll be uh, getting to them. With that, uh, uh, overly long introduction, let me say that I think uh, what I would like to do with Tony's permission is talk uh, about some general things uh, in, in this area and about one or two other places and then after a while, uh, since we are where we are and we are who we are, uh, consider some of his controversial uh, utterances about the policies of the Israeli government. So, Tony, I'm going to give you a chance to begin to get a word in uh, and to set uh, the discussion uh, in terms of your probable disagreement with Mr. Buckley. Uh, I remind everybody unnecessarily that human rights problems, alleged human rights violations, are a big subject ranging around the world. Uh, from Chile to Uruguay to Poland to Syria to Indonesia to you name it. And the first question I'd like to ask you to begin your comments is uh, what do you think, if anything, a country like ours, however strong it still is, can undertake realistically to do about these violations, about these problems, running all around the world. I think your word realistically is a, <clears throat> a very important one, Marvin. Uh, this country cannot cure all the ills of a world that is a lot of the time a terrible world. Hannah Arendt said this terrible century, and it, is, it has been a terrible century in human rights terms, human life terms. But I think there are two reasons <clears throat> why we must engage ourselves in the proposition that you've described, caring about the inhumanities of governments elsewhere to their own people. The first is to save our own souls. Uh, to sit quietly by, to close our eyes while these things happen is unacceptable to us. Whether we can help or not, independently, I think it's essential that we try for our sake. And secondly, uh, to some degree, we can make a difference. Uh, realism, I. I used your word, uh, I mean I applauded your word, uh, says we must not have exaggerated notions of what we can do. Uh, we must not uh, dream uh, that we can uh, change a Soviet government and make it into a uh, pussycat. It's not like that. Uh, but we can make a difference at the edge. Uh, Jacobo Timmerman knew uh, 
uh, when he got out of Argentina and out of the torture cells with the swastikas on the walls, uh, that he got out and that he lived because the United States government said to Argentina, you must not kill this man. It's only one person, but I would say that uh, in the scale of things, if you save one life every once in a while, it's worth trying. Well, I think, at least in his speeches, as things went along, Jimmy Carter agreed with you and made, uh, he said, made international human rights a centerpiece of his foreign policy. Uh, you are a, a critic who pulls no punches. What is your scorecard on Jimmy Carter in this respect? <clears throat> Well, I will tell you honestly that when he came to office, I probably was more enthusiastic about him than I should have been because he, he talked about human rights in a way that agreed with the view I've just stated, that we have to try. And I thought, and I still believe, that he was uh, sounding what are basic American ideals. And we'll come to that in time, but I think that... Uh, in addition to the reasons I gave for having an international human rights policy in this country, there is the factor of inevitability. It reflects the American character. That's the way we feel. We don't like governments that torture and kill their citizens. I hope we, we don't, and I believe we don't. Um, so I thought, and I still think, that he was reflecting that correct view, a view which differed from uh, his immediate predecessors uh, who really wanted to close their eyes uh, to such things. But I think if there's be criticism now, it is, um, I'd be slightly less enthusiastic, though I'm still pro approving, because I think possibly he made it seem too easy and too simple and made our power seem too great and raised expectations too high. Uh, and I'll say for the third time that in this field, however much one uh, has to care and Believe in principles, realism is essential. Apart from the question of realism, there have been questions raised about the earnestness or the sincerity of his policies. Uh, on the one hand, uh, he was uh, free to criticize uh, the Soviet Union and uh, sometimes uh, even reach into places uh, like Argentina. On the other hand, uh, he seemed to bear very manfully and silently uh, what some people called human rights violations in places like the Philippines and South Korea and Pakistan uh, and elsewhere. Uh, what do you say to that? Does that suggest that the human rights thing is another uh, scheme of moralistic American ploy that we uh, whip out when it's convenient and uh, keep quiet about when it's inconvenient? Very important question and very difficult question on which we could easily spend the rest of the evening. We'll give you three minutes. Okay. Um, there is a strain of moralism in American <clears throat> political history which has real dangers. The exemplar of that was Woodrow Wilson who thought, uh, you've reminded me to use his name because it is the example of what I, the danger I mentioned earlier of trying to do too much and over-promising. Woodrow Wilson left people with the impression that the world could be remade in the American image. And as Mr. Buckley, I understand, said last week, he left the world perhaps just a little worse off than it was when he found it. Uh, we mustn't pretend uh, that we can do everything or that we're nobler than anybody else. Uh, that's a very important thing. We have strong views as Americans, but uh, nobility as a piece of bravado does not work very well in persuading people. Now, the other thing, in my th hopeless three minutes in answer to that no, question... I, I, I was kidding. <laughs> it's your night. Okay. Um, the other thing is this, that people want consistency in human rights policy. Uh, they yearn in some inchoate way for the United States government to be able to tell everybody, we apply exactly the same rules, we do everything exactly the same, whether it's South Korea or the Soviet Union or Chile or Bulgaria, whatever. We're going to be exactly the same. But just as in life things are not exactly the same, so in human rights policy they cannot be. You do 
the best you can in each situation. And it may be that you will decide on the advice of your Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights Policy that the best way to save the life of the poet who is uh, an opposition politician in South Korea, Kim Dae Jung, is to go quietly to the head of state and say, if you kill uh, Kim Dae Jung, American aid will stop. We're just telling you that now so you'll know. And uh, you may decide that there's some better way to do it in some other country. So that figures in. And then there's still one other very large subject I have to mention in this too long answer, but it it's a very complicated subject. You left out what I think is the most dramatic example of inconsistency in American treatment of this subject, whether under Carter, before or since, and that's China. Uh, when President Nixon went to China, <clears throat> this country went through sort of a, a China craze, and China, the People's Republic was wonderful, everything was marvelous, there were no more flies in China, everything worked on time, it was just marvelous. And nobody mentioned what some at least should have known, that there were a lot of political prisoners in China and that it was a quite extreme tyranny. That was the latter part of the Cultural Revolution. It was not a happy democracy, to say the least. And I attribute that failure to point that out in part to the political exigencies I've mentioned. People thought, well, it's probably better for the victims of oppression in China uh, as well as better for other reasons, that the United States should have a relationship to China, so don't let's complicate it by mentioning this unpleasant subject. Um, and the other reason is a cultural one, and it's best to admit it to ourselves. Um, we are not as familiar with Chinese culture, most of us. We don't respond to it in exactly the same way. Um, so we have a harder time identifying. This at least is my belief, and I wish you'd correct me if you don't agree. But I think if one of us has met a Soviet refusenik, for example, as I have quite a few times, we can see ourselves in that exact situation. That could be us, could be me, so easily. It's not the same um, in the Chinese situation. It's a, it's a more remote culture. We're less likely to meet that person. We're less likely to understand his or her psychology and uh, atmosphere. Well, without picking up on the details, I suppose people who are uh, down the line human rightsers uh, are able to empathize pretty effectively uh, with Orientals as well as uh, Europeans and other things are going on and you've suggested some of them and I, in any event, don't want to keep you with that. But let's uh, be uh, nonpartisan. Uh, after Carter came uh, Mr. Reagan and there were intimations, at least, uh, that there were going to be serious changes in respect of this subject. There was a Mr. Lefevre, who was almost forgotten, and I take it you were not in favor of his appointment to succeed I, Pat Terry. I'm not sure I should tell this out of court, but I believe I met you in the hearing room, didn't I? Yes, I... <laughs> when Mr. I was, Mr. Lefevre was <clears throat> being questioned by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at his confirmation hearing, I believe I saw Judge Frankel in the room uh, as I was. I was uh, doing a, an eloquent uh, bit of testimony against the uh, confirmation of Mr. Lefevre uh, which would have been, uh, if not effective, at least noticed, except that after I got through, uh, Jacobo Timmerman merely stood up in the hearing room and didn't say anything, and he, <laughs> he sank Mr. Lefevre, and they forgot me in the process, uh, uh, which was all right. Uh, but then it came a number of things, Tony, that we know about and that I think you have views about. Uh, Elliot Abrams and Jean Kirkpatrick, and uh, her, uh, I guess, main claim to fame in this field is a pair of labels that she uh, uh, proclaimed, the distinction between authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, uh, um, which was the subject of cartoons and so on. And I take it the basic blunt distinction is not something you thought useful, but did it have any merit at all? Did it identify any lines of distinction that should have meaning for us, or was it just silly? 
I think that uh, as a method of having a political science discussion about the possibility of change in uh, dictatorial governments, it might be a useful notion. I think it's a little too simple even on that level. Um, but her proposition was that totalitarian governments, which is the word she used to define all communist governments, uh, were essentially not subject to change, that they were there for good and you never could change them, whereas authoritarian governments, by which she meant dictatorial regimes of the right, could be changed as they have been changed in Spain and Portugal and some other places, Greece. And that's an interesting political science idea, but I don't think it had any merit when it came to discussion of human rights policy, because frankly, if somebody is, <clears throat> is on is having uh, electric shocks applied to his body, uh, I don't think it matters a great deal under what ideology that uh, torture is applied. It doesn't to me, and I doubt very much that it does to the victim. Um, and uh, I don't know if you're gonna go on with this, but I, I would say some things about the practical results of the policy if you desire. No, I think we, we'd be happy to have you go on with it. Well, the distinction that Mr. Lefevre made, and uh, made not only, uh, he was the nominee, as we've said, who was then withdrawn uh, because uh, the opposition to him was so strong, and Elliot Abrams became Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. Um, Mr. Lefevre said, and I think not entirely on his own, uh, not at all on his own, I think he said it because that was the view of the president and those around him, and that's why he was appointed that the United States should be concerned openly only with the, in this area with criticizing communist governments. And as to, as to right-wing uh, regimes, dictatorships, uh, Mr. Lefevre said flatly, we have no business interfering in their governments. And uh, uh, it's true, we could say something quietly, and he was asked at the hearing, to which governments in recent years would you have said something quietly, and he would not name any. So in essence, it was going to be a, a policy focusing on human rights outrages only in the Soviet Union and among its uh, client states. Well, let us look at the results. Uh, it's too simple to say that that's been the policy because Mr. Abrams has had a more sophisticated policy and perhaps we can go into that. But just look at the results. We're now nearly three years into this declared sharp change from the um, Carter policy policy that didn't start with Jimmy Carter, but started with the United States Congress, I should say, during the Nixon years, when Congress's patience gave out for executive toleration of torture and cruelty, and Congress wrote into the law certain human rights standards for the giving of foreign aid and so on. No foreign aid for countries that torture, and so on. Anyway, here we are three years into the new policy, and the focus is supposed to be on the Soviet Union. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, can anyone in this room believe that the situation of the victims in the Soviet Union is better than it was three years ago because of the change in policy, this focus on uh, the Soviet Union, uh, merely to make the statement is to, is to show how preposterous it is. Uh, the crackdown has been very severe on all dissident movements. The, the, the pathetic little few people who tried to perform in the Soviet Union what Marvin Frankel and others do in this country, namely merely to watch watch the observance of the Helsinki Agreement, most of them, the majority of them are in prison. All they were doing was writing reports, uh, and not very many at that. Um, Jewish emigration uh, in 1979, the peak year, there were on average about 4,000 Jews a month being allowed to emigrate from the Soviet Union. Last month, October 1982, 168 were allowed to emigrate and that's about the average this year. That's from the National Conference on Soviet Jewry. 168 against 4,000. Well, I wouldn't say that was a record of signal success as to the concentration on the Soviet Union, and I don't think it's any better in other spheres. To be fair, uh, this government, this administration, like its predecessor, has done, has saved Kim Dae Jung's life in South Korea. Once again, as it happens, they've done the same thing. But in Chile and Argentina and some other places, they have been, well, inadequate. Let me, I wanna to get to Sharansky and, and some of your views about the Russian thing with more detail, but is it fair or relevant to suggest that the Reagan view on this subject 
is in some sense a reaction because of their perception that we tended under Carter to beat upon our friends excessively and go too easy on our enemies in connection with these human rights subjects. Was there anything to that? Has the Reagan administration, in your view, uh, effected some improvement in this respect? Uh, that was the stated uh, view, and it's, it's, it's right that you call my attention to that. Um, I think mixed in with it was a general sense that President Carter and his people in this field were sort of do-gooders, uh, not practical men and women, as it happens to be. And Assistant Secretary was a woman, Pat Deering. Um, well, I've already said what I did about how practical the alternative policy has been, but as to your point that we were beating up on our <clears throat> friends, the answer to that depends on your definition of friends. Uh, do we want to be, do we want to claim as our friends uh, the military rulers of Argentina who uh, uh, disposed of 10 or 20,000 people in unmarked graves or dropping them into the sea, kidnapping them. I have my doubts that it is good for in the interest of the United States to have them as our, quote, friends, unquote. I'm very doubtful of that. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Kirkpatrick, Ambassador Kirkpatrick, um, has made visits to Argentina and to Chile uh, as a point of showing our friendship for those uh, right-wing authoritarian governments. She declined in Chile to see the human rights leaders who asked to see her. Uh, they were shortly after uh, expelled or arrested and tortured. I'm rather doubtful myself that it's practical <clears throat> to um, base one's foreign policy on such friends. I don't think they're of much use. I don't mean to sound too, um, what shall I say, eth ethereal about it, because it is to put it mildly, an imperfect world. And we have to have diplomatic relations with a lot of governments we don't like. Or we have to do business with people we don't like because most of the world is governed by people that we in this country would not regard as uh, very humane. But there's a limit to how far we go. If I could add, I, I've always thought in thinking about this contrast between friends and enemies that insofar as the one or another country is uh, a place we view as friendly, uh, to uh, take the view that we shouldn't try to force human rights on them is a little bit paradoxical. It's as though human rights is bad for you, whereas I don't think that. And I think that to the extent we can promote human rights in Argentina or Chile or wherever we are undertaking to do something good for that country, if not for the uh, particular group that happens to be running this show at the moment. My only caution there, of course I agree with you philosophically, and I think it's what makes this country strong. I think we get stronger when we <coughs> obey the law in this country and when we uh, abide by the civil rights written into the con Constitution, the liberties and the protections of human life and decency. But my only caution is that I don't want to be seen to be in the position of saying that Chile or Argentina or anybody has to have the United States Constitution as its. I, it's, it's, I just don't want to be too paternalistic about it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Actually, if, if they're lucky, they'll get a better constitution. <laughs> um, uh, let's uh, talk a little more about our enemies, and, and you know my views about uh, Helsinki and so on, which are probably something like yours, but I want to raise with you a question on which, uh, like everything else, I have views, but uh, I want to hear yours. We have the Helsinki Accords now for seven years, we had Arthur Goldberg in Belgrade in 77. Mr. Campbellman has been back and forth in Madrid for about two years now, spanning two administrations, which is interesting. Reagan had kept him on. And he and the Soviets have been hollering at each other a lot in Madrid and adjourning and reconvening. Um, what good does it do? Well, that's not such a happy question because I think we have to face the fact I mentioned earlier about the emigres, the Jewish emigration and the dissidents. Uh, their lot has gotten worse. Uh, not 
because, I hasten to add, of our concern for the Helsinki Agreement, but because of other factors in Soviet-American relations. They are uh, really tied, as it turns out, um, I think certainly the people concerned with the problem in this country, notably the, the National Conference, uh, have concluded sadly that they really are tied to the general state of Soviet-American relations, and as long as they remain so bad, the victims are going to be victimized. Um, however, I think the, the realistic question to ask yourself is this. Is it better that we have the human rights standards of the Helsinki Final Act agreed to by the Soviet Union, or would it be better if those did not exist, or if, as some, perhaps Mr. Buckley uh, would suggest, uh, we denounce the agreement because the Soviet Union has not complied with it, as indeed it has certainly not, not at all, outrageously not at all. Well, my notion is that it is better to have those standards there. They are international standards. The Soviet Union has signed them. It, has, it is therefore not in a position rightly to complain that anybody is intruding in its internal affairs, as it likes to say. They are not internal affairs because the Soviet Union has undertaken to comply internationally in an internationally recognized document to comply with certain rather minimal decencies. Having done so, that act becomes a standard against which we can hold the Soviet behavior. And of course we're frustrated, of course we're unhappy uh, that its behavior falls far short of those standards. I still think it's better to have them there. Let's, uh, you talked about the National Conference. Uh, for all I know, its representatives uh, may be here and, and agree with much of, you, of what you say. Let's go to your marvelous column about Anatoly Sharansky of this past uh, Thursday in the Times. I mentioned to you before we came out here, and I take the liberty of mentioning that on the following day, I was at a small breakfast with Avital Sharansky, his wife, and uh, the kind of uh, dramatic symbol she is, and the kind of vibrant, uh, moving one person crusade that she is, I don't have to go on at length about in this audience, but it was a very small group and a very light breakfast and uh, we really were interested in talking uh, business and the question to which we did not have a definitive answer, I'm going to put to you not expecting a definitive answer, but your thoughts uh, what is to be done? Sharansky uh, today is in about the 55th day of a hunger strike. He may uh, die soon. Uh, his life becomes a kind of focus of these human rights efforts the way Timmermans did and other individuals do. And he looms much larger though he's just one man. But the question arose and there was no clear, crisp, single answer, what is to be done? Is there anything to be done? Uh, uh, you, you wrote what you wrote, uh, attempting to be of influence. Uh, whether it will help, we don't know. What do you think? Well, I think the main thing is that one has to try in any sphere possible. Your group has to try, the National Conference has to try, newspaper columnists, and most of all, the United States government has to try. Uh, Secretary Schultz has done so, and I think done it in the right way. Uh, to my uh, understanding, at his first meeting with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Gromyko, he made a point of the human rights and Jewish emigration issues. He uh, spoke at length, seriously, uh, on those questions and made it clear that they were questions that would help determine uh, the level of Soviet-American relationships. And I think that's necessary because um, it is true that the Soviet leadership, being what it is, will, I think, in if it cares enough about some internal disciplinary question, if it thinks it's threatened 
It will do what it wants to do no matter what anybody else says, absolutely. Uh, I think there are some things on which you just cannot move them because they see their existence at stake, whether rightly or wrongly. I think very often wrongly, but they're, well, frightened. Um, but short of that ultimate, you can hope to impress them and it is necessary to say those things because the Soviet leaders may not understand this country as much as, as well as we think they understand it. They certainly didn't understand about, for example, the Jackson-Vanik Amendment. I happened to be in Moscow at the time the Jackson-Vanik Amendment was under consideration in Congress. And uh, I spoke with a uh, quite an influential person who raised the Jackson-Vanik Amendment raised it with me and then dismissed it rather scornfully saying, we know this game that's being played, you're gonna play this game about the Jackson-Vanik Amendment and the Jewish emigration, but then in the end, nothing will happen because Nixon is gonna uh, decide these things. We know he really decides these things, it's just a sort of a play you're putting on. And I said, please believe me when I tell you that it's not a play and the President of the United States does not dispose of such issues, that Congress has the ultimate voice please don't take that view, but he just thought I was, you know, part of the game, and they may be misled. So the answer to your question, I think, uh, frustrating as it is, is only to keep making the point. There is nothing overt we can do. We live in a nuclear world. We're not going to go to war about it. All we can do is to tell them that it really will matter on issues that they will care about. What did you think about Jackson Vanek? Was it, was it a mistake? Tough question. Um, the figures suggest it probably was a mistake uh, because since the, uh, it's not so clear actually because after the passage of the amendment, which I think was 73, uh, the emigration figures kept going up till 1979 when they dropped sharply down and they dropped down because of other reasons in Soviet American relations. So I, maybe the more accurate answer is that um, the amendment did not in itself have much effect one way or the other on the level of Jewish emigration, which was a captive of other matters. But I think it did have an adverse effect in another area, and that is that the Soviet leadership and even Soviet citizens to a considerable degree have this feeling that they are still after uh, 65 years regarded by the Western world as not quite legitimate and they don't like anything that seems to them to challenge their legitimacy. And they, they read this in such a way so that the amendment did have uh, a disruptive effect on Soviet American relations in a more general psychological way, I think. If you were advising Elliot Abrams or anybody holding that job, would you be recommending that he find ways to bargain with the Soviets and others about human rights, find things to trade off, things to exchange for the life of a Sharansky or other things that we hold dear? You don't ask easy questions, do you? <laughs> I, I, I figure you ought to teach us something when you come to New York. It's not, an, it's not a totally novel idea. Uh, exchanges of persons have certainly happened uh, before. Um, the, um, uh, the man who was the principal uh, source, our first principal source about the practice of putting people in mental institutions, um, Bukowski, uh, was gotten out in an exchange for uh, a uh, communist leader in Chile, I think. And uh, human exchanges of that kind are possible, although they leave a bad taste with people like us. We don't think that, uh, at least I don't, that in general we want to use hostages and we want to start exchanging people in such a way. We think that uh, people should have rights uh, apart from such ex exchanges. If it came to saving the life of uh, Sharansky, of course I would think we should do that. More generally, uh, I think it is necessary in the harsh world we live in 
to consider human rights among other objectives when we make arrangements with the Soviet Union. Uh, I noticed the other day that at his press conference <clears throat> immediately after the, the death of uh, President Brezhnev, uh, President Reagan said that um, um, it wasn't up to us to move first on improving Soviet-American relations. Uh, after all, we had done that when he lifted the grain embargo on the Soviet Union and he asked, what did we get for that? That was his question. Asked, what did we get for that? My question is, what did he ask? And the answer was, nothing. He did not negotiate when he lifted that embargo, he just did it. And it may be in this tough world that when you do things like that, you have to negotiate and get something like this. Let's go back to Timmerman for a minute and then we ought to get to some other Jews before we open <laughs> this thing to uh, questions on the index cards. Uh, Timmerman, after his book was published and even before, uh, was somehow a subject of uh, extensive attacks here in America, some of them sort of violent and some of them nasty and snide. Uh, some uh, by neoconservatives, uh, even in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, how do you account for that? Uh, did you have a sense of the hostility to Timmerman as a person and for what he uh, was proclaiming? And did you have a reaction to the feelings of hostility toward him? I certainly felt the hostility. I thought it was extraordinary. Uh, here was a man who had been uh, kidnapped uh, by unidentified men, taken to a place of torture, nearly killed, uh, interrogated about his Jewishness, tortured as a Jew, mocked. Um, huh. I love the assurance with which that's said. Please, by all means. Oh, Marvin, how do you feel? Is it, is it all right if the... Yes, come on up. Please. Briefly. In the meantime, in the meantime, I will give both our speakers uh, another item with respect to Mr. Timmerman, uh, when I was with a group of uh, Bar Association people visiting in Argentina on these uh, subjects, uh, can you leap up? Uh, um, <laughs> we, uh, we met with some Jewish leaders of an agency called the Daya, an umbre umbrella Jewish organization. And we asked them what we could do in the United States to be helpful for them. And they said with kind of characteristic uh, Jewish gestures, do us a favor, don't do us no favors, don't help us. Uh, and they were obviously fearful of our raising a fuss about their situation. And I have a feeling that plays a part in the discussions of Mr. Timmerman, but sir? Okay, sir. Uh, First, I, th I thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to at least to give the facts as they are. Because I do feel- Could you tell us I'm, who you are? Okay, I present myself. My name is Jacob Stern. I'm a physician. I was born 1927 in a country called Poland. Most of the people born in that year I'm Jewish, perished. The tool simply was prussic acid. I, they didn't ask me to represent them, they're not here. But we have a group of physicians, lawyers, who were young kids when they were liberated from Dachau and Auschwitz. And their memories cry to us to remember and not distort the truth to the question about Timmerman. I would like to present to you an article by a gentleman 
that you probably know, maybe he's your neighbor in Boston, right? Benno Weiser, right? I Do you know who that is? Warren, Warren. Well, this gentleman served as a representative of the state of Israel for about 10 years in South America. He's an expert on South America. He wrote an article called The Canonization of Jacoba Timmerman. His points are, Mr. Timmerman was not arrested because he was a Jew. That's my main point. Nor did I say you, so. You just said it before. No, forgive me if I repeat what I said before. I did not say that. Is there a and I don't believe it. He was arrested for other reasons, which we will discuss in a minute. But he was tortured in particularly, more extremely, and he saw others treated worse because they were Jews. That's different. But That's you what I believe. No, no, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, let me, Mr. Let me, Mr. Lewis. Let me, since I'm the oldest Did you here, say that he Mr. was arrested Stern. because he's a Jew? Dr. Stern, Dr. Yeah. Stern. Uh, I, I was born in 1920. Pardon? I was born in 1920. When, 1920, which gives me seven years extra seven. wisdom. All right. And I read, I read Timmerman's book, and in fairness to him and to Mr. Lewis, uh, neither Timmerman nor Lewis claims that he was imprisoned because he was a Jew. He does not say that. Mr. Tim well, Mr. Lewis but, said that. But you no, just won the argument. That. Okay. He, All right. he's, thank saying. you. Thank you. I want the He didn't no. say it, and oh, if no. he said it, he retracts it. We're friends. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's. Let us. Pardon? Let's go on. Do you have yes. Else you want to say Dr. Stern, I think yes. we were going to go on. Uh, pardon? May I? Uh, let's go on for a few minutes. You may keep us company here, but let yeah, us. Uh, Did you uh, want to say something else? I. I want to ask, I have got all these thickly typed index cards and I have saved for the end uh, the most hostile and difficult questions that I could put to Tony Lewis uh, concerning his uh, many writings about Israel. And I don't want to get into a lot of nonsense about uh, whether he's an anti-Semite, which he is not, and whether he's anti-Israeli, which he is not, but I... I want, to, uh, I want to get into questions about the, uh, about the validity. I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask the people who are in the audience so that we can have a discussion and disagreements to do what the management requested and to send up questions on their cards and prove that things that Tony or I say are incorrect and they'll all be heard. But in the meantime, I want to put in uh, some questions that I think are perhaps on the minds of many Jews, including even some of the people who are singing out. So Tony, uh, we know about uh, very, could I ask you not to interrupt anymore? Uh, we know about your positions, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask you two or three questions that uh, get uh, a little more pointed, subject to what other people want to ask you that may be more pointed. Um, and first, to what extent, since our subject is human rights, are your uh, criticisms of Israeli government policies fairly to be described as within our subject, that is, criticisms on grounds of human rights violations? I would say to a rather small extent. My main um, uh, criticism of the present government of Israel is in political terms that I would call, uh, well, um, existence. My belief is that the policy of the uh, Israeli government, if followed on its present path, as there is every reason to believe it will be, will result inevitably in the destruction of Israel. Well, you have to narrow this. I agree with what you said about what I see in your columns, but you have actually, I think we ought to face it, raised what I would call human rights questions yes. about the West Bank. You've uh, made accusations concerning censorship, uh, 
accusations about uh, what I, in general, call police behavior toward uh, dissident Arabs and so on. And in doing that, I think many Jews would say, uh, whatever I personally might say, that you have imposed on the Israelis a uh, very stringent double standard. There are three million Jews, more or less, in Israel. And the four billion people in the UN, who are, who are supposed to be represented in the UN, seem to have nothing else to do but holler about mm. Israeli violations. Um, is it correct to say, Tony, that you implicitly or explicitly impose on the uh, Jews in Israel a higher standard in the sense that you overlook uh, how they were treated in Syria and Iraq and Iran, uh, beaten, tortured, hanged in the streets, and so on. Uh, and is it right that you should do that? Um, let's leave the second part to, for someone else to judge. Uh, Fair whether, enough. Whether it's right or not, well, other people will decide. It is what I... Please, 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 let him answer is, the question. You're not is, helping yourself or this discussion. Uh, go ahead, Tony. The answer to your first question is yes. I hold Israel to a higher standard than I do some of the other countries, or all the other countries you've mentioned, as do Israelis. In the same way that I hold the United States to a higher standard than I would hold Syria or Iraq or Iran or such countries. It hardly needs to be said, in my opinion. When Richard Nixon <clears throat> violated the rights of, this, of the people of this country in Watergate, I didn't write columns saying, well, it could be worse in Iraq. Please, ladies and gentlemen, we apply to our countries and those countries we love the standards that they uphold. Israel is a democracy. <clears throat> Just no, 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 no. You're, if, if we come back to Argentina, I'll call no, on you. Back. I want to talk about Israel. No, I'm sorry. I, I, in fact, doctor, I really think it's not fair for you to stay here. Could we excuse the doctor? No, no, I will not. I will I'll be happy to read it. Uh, okay. Okay. Bye. Can I keep this? No, no. This is the letter the way you wrote it. Venom comes out of your pen. Let me read it. I'll give it back to you afterward. Okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. They're discussing oh. the securities markets, actually. <laughs> what if I meet you later? I'll show you the letter. You Tony, if, if I can distract you for a minute, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you uh, another leading, I uh, hope not misleading question. As you uh, think of yourself as an opinion molder, uh, and I'm sure you are, do you feel that the manner and means by which you hold Israel to a higher standard is an effective way for you to teach or press your positions, or could you do better? I probably could do better, and the well, fact that you asked the question so indicates. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing you in this direction, and soon I'll let people ask you hostile questions. I should confess that, that mostly I am not in bitter disagreement with uh, Tony Lewis, having, uh, been, having been brainwashed long ago by his Gideon's trumpet and other little frolics. But Tony, uh, right now, the Israelis are conducting a moving and dramatic demonstration, and I see you nodding out of the corner of my bifocals. They, in a time of the utmost stress and national agony and torn by dissension, are conducting a self-examination lighted by the whole world's television and news cameras, and I think exhibiting an extraordinary measure of civilization and concern beyond anything that uh, one can think of, at least quickly. I don't remember us, us ever 
holding a self-inspection about what we did to the people we used to call Indians, and so on and so on around the world. I don't think you've written a column about that. Ah, uh, Marvin, in, uh, I am in total agreement. <laughs> when the matter arose, and when Prime Minister Begin, for a period of a week or 10 days, I forget the exact uh, number of days, uh, re strongly resisted the appointment of a commission of inquiry, I wrote and I believed that Israel would not allow that decision to stand. Not only Israel, but the Jewish tradition. I wrote a column, which I, I don't always remember everything I write, but this happened to mean a lot to me, and I remember it very clearly. I wrote a column saying that Jews had regarded rightly with horror the fact that the world averted its eyes from what happened in the Holocaust and that it was the Jewish tradition not to avert one's eyes from evil and that that was the deepest thing that would never be allowed. And I said, Mr. Begin may try, but neither Israel's politics nor the Jewish tradition will allow that to happen. So of course I agree with you that it is a great and wonderful thing and I have complete confidence that it will, as Justice Barak said the other day to a woman who said, a witness who said bewilderedly to this group of three men, justice must be done, and Barak said, justice will be done. I know it will. Well, you give a, a man born in 1920 who's been a teacher and a judge uh, a microphone and let him get near a newspaper pundit and he's not gonna let the opportunity go by completely. I would just urge before I turn to these more pointed questions, Tony, that perhaps in the effort to persuade and enlist your fellow Jews as well as other people, it would be well if you would take less for granted the wonderful things that I think you know and believe about the Jews. And I know you don't like to be unsubtle, but it wouldn't hurt occasionally, I'm suggesting, to write a celebration of the Jews and perhaps a column about this tribunal uh, just to remind people of what you know and I know and all the people who admire you know that uh, you have deep appreciation of these things as well as the criticisms that you <clears throat> express so well. Marvin, uh, you must be right for one reason. Your view is exactly the same as my mother's. <laughs> she's, she's sitting right in the middle there and she looked up at me as you asked that question and I think there is something to what you say. <laughs> now, my job is... My job... My... You're not actually the moderator here. Why don't you please... Stop. I have nothing to do with you. I uh, am right there. The, the second question, the treatment of Jews from Arab countries, the one million that were expelled, and then the 600 Ethiopian Jews that have been killed for the past four. Answer those two questions, I can provide. All right. You've stated your position, and those are not questions, and let's move yeah. on. Now, I, uh, at this point, become a uh, neutral reader of questions, and I have to forget that I'm a lawyer because the very first question here, if I were a lawyer, I'd say, uh, fails to lay a foundation, whatever that means. Uh, but I'm gonna ask them just like they're asked, and uh, Tony, who spent a year at the Harvard Law School, among his many other misadventures, will cope with whether there's a foundation or not. It says here, Tony, what accounts for the New York Times' consistent reluctance to report on or criticize human rights violations in Romania? Um, it's actually, it is actually a fair question. Uh, I don't, I'm not in a position uh, to know the answer uh, because my function is a limited one. Um, not always a popular one, but uh, it is to give my opinion. And I don't, I'm not involved in making those decisions. Um, but my impression is, 
don't know the reason. There may be many reasons. Difficulty getting a reporter into the country, the difficulty of getting the facts. Uh, but my impression is, uh, in agreement with the questioner, that uh, human rights conditions are growing worse in Romania. It is a serious question and um, one that uh, you know, attention should be paid to. But as to the particulars of the coverage of our paper, I really don't know the answer. Okay, this one says, one rationale for American reluctance to refuse aid to nations with bad human rights records is that this will force them into the arms of the Soviet Union. Do you feel there is any justification for this fear? And can you think of any cases where it has happened? Uh, that's a very good uh, and sophisticated question. Um, beginning at the end, uh, Marvin, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any cases where it has happened where the suspension of American aid, which has certainly not occurred very often, has been followed by a, a country falling into the Soviet orbit. Um, I know of no such case. But the, but the questioner nevertheless has, has a serious and, as I said, sophisticated point. Because we, one of the reasons for us to be modest, as I said at the beginning, and cautious about trying to impose our views on other countries is that it may not work out very well, as it didn't work out very well with Woodrow Wilson's moralism. Um, in other words, if we conspire, for example, in the overthrow of a harsh government, um, the successor may be worse. It is not so unusual that that should happen. And uh, in general, for that reason, I think it is quite wrong for the United States to be involved in attempts to replace other governments. For me, the business of withholding aid comes more under the first heading of what I said were the possible purposes of an active uh, international human rights policy in the United States, and that is to save our own souls. If in fact we know that a government in, shall we say, Chile, uh, is imprisoning and torturing people, then I think it is wrong for us to be involved, even this generality may be going too far, but I think we should be very cautious about involving ourselves in helping that government, both to save our own soul and as a matter of self-interest, because uh, usually governments like that have a rather modest half-life. They leave in due course, and then people remember who helped them. Next, a somewhat different subject. Is there a relationship between human rights and world economic stability? Also, does overpopulation threaten the liberties of individuals in countries like Brazil, South Africa, etc.? Uh, very large questions. Maybe all I can do is to say uh, that yes, uh, economic or population pressures may make people seek shortcut political solutions. It is in conditions of economic and I would add psychological stress that a Hitler arises, a Mussolini arises. Um, so the two uh, do have a connection. Wouldn't it be better, this questioner asks, if the United Nations or some other international body took up the cause of human rights rather than one country carrying the whole burden? Do you think the United Nations would be capable of this? Well, I wouldn't join in the scornful laughter, but I have to say that I have a degree of skepticism about the answer to the question. Um, we all know the disabilities of the United Nations, um, and it, there is something inherently illogical about committing uh, to a body made up of representatives of a many, many governments, a large number of which, as I said earlier, uh, do not meet even our minimal standards of decency, uh, passing judgment on the decency of governments. Uh, but, in fact, uh, there is a United Nations Commission on Human Rights. I think Judge Frankel knows a lot more about it than I do. Uh, but uh, 
even in that difficult situation, it, it has been possible within that commission to develop particular ambassadors, representatives who are concerned about this issue and for their own reasons uh, or because the choice of the commission members comes out that way, uh, do do some good. So yes, we want to use any available forum. We'll use the United, I think we should use the United Nations or any forum. But in the end, you can't escape the responsibility of deciding what you want to do. Having done what you can in international forums, you still face the question, do we want to aid country X? Do we want our ambassador to the United Nations to go to country Y and smile on the dictatorial rulers and refuse to see the representatives of the victims? Those questions are always going to be there. You can't avoid them. I, I don't really know more about any of this than you do, Tony, but I will add that the Commission on Human Rights is uh, worth paying attention to and that one of the less uh, commendable chapters in the Reagan history on this subject was to cause its representative to back off from a commission position on the disappearance problem in Argentina and Chile on which the commission seemed to be making some progress until we realigned ourselves uh, with the people I would regard on the, as the villains on this, on this subject. Please comment on USAID and its continuance to El Salvador vis-a-vis -vis human rights abuses. I think you have here in El Salvador a dramatic example of what I mentioned in passing in answer to one of Judge Frankel's earlier questions. That is that concern about these issues is an ineradicable part of the American character and American political reality. Um, when the Reagan administration took office, uh, the then Secretary of State, Mr. Haig, proclaimed that, um, in essence, as it was parodied, it wasn't far off from the parody, that the future of freedom lay in El Salvador and that we had to draw a military line in El Salvador. Um, he was, I think it's probably, uh, an understatement to say that he was not overly concerned about human rights violations in El Salvador. And from my own point of view, I thought perhaps the low point of his tenure in office uh, was when he suggested, without any basis in fact, or even fancy, at a congressional hearing that the four church women who were murdered <clears throat> in El Salvador, four United States church women, might have died in, as he put it, an exchange of fire. Um, well, here we are now, nearly three years later, and what is on the agenda uh, for the tough Hague-appointed American ambassador in San Salvador, Dean Hinton, human rights. Why? Because there is no way, no way for even Dean Hinton or Ronald Reagan or his administration to escape the fact that the people of the United States don't want to be associated with a government that kills people wholesale. 30,000 civilians have died in El Salvador, been murdered in El Salvador in the last three years, most of them according to the American embassy itself at the hands of representatives of its government. Not one single official, not one has been convicted of any crime in connection therewith. And it has become so intolerable uh, that uh, Ambassador Hinton, Hinton has rather brusquely and forthrightly uh, told the El Salvador Chamber of Commerce, a conservative organization, uh, that it can't go on that way if United States aid is to continue. I think that is simply a reflection of the political truth I mentioned. Tony, I keep thinking as I go from one question to another how some of us lawyers prepare for a week to argue. And <laughs> this one asks, did you openly write about the killing of Christian Lebanese as you did about the killings in the Beirut Palestinian camps? I never did write a column about conditions in Lebanon before the um, a war this summer. And uh, I think I probably was wrong not to do so. I will tell you why I did not do so. Because it is 
a subject of daunting complexity. The questioner says the killings of Christians, but there were killings of everybody. Uh, that was the nature of the problem. When I first went to Lebanon, I was passing through Beirut years ago, and before I, I left, I stopped and saw the Lebanese ambassador here, a wonderful gentleman with the great advantage of having been a journalist, Ghassan Twaini. And uh, after we talked for some time, he said, are you going to write about the Lebanese political situation? And I was rather embarrassed because I didn't intend to, not knowing much about it. And I thought, well, it would be insulting to admit that I wasn't, but I bravely admitted that I didn't intend to. He said, that's very wise, very wise. I don't believe anyone should write about Lebanon unless he was born there or just flies over it in an airplane. <clears throat> and it's not, it's not really funny. There's a serious point to it, ladies and gentlemen, and that is that the communal disputes in Lebanon go back not just one year or seven years to the intrusion of the PLO and the PLO state within a state. They go back to the founding of Lebanon after World War II. The communal differences have been there from the start. It has been a country based on mortal suspicion between people of different religion and within the religions. You know, it's customary of journalists, including me, to talk about Lebanese Christians as a group. But in fact, there are six or seven major Christian sects in uh, Lebanon who do not trust each other, who are bitterly opposed to each other on many occasions. The largest is the Maronites, and there are Greek Orthodox and Armenians and so on and so on. Within the Maronite group, this is merely the largest group of Christians. I'm talking about the difficulty of disentangling who is responsible for what. The group that has now, in effect, taken power, the Falange, uh, was founded by Pierre Jamail in the 1930s. Incidentally, though this isn't a conclusive fact as of today, the name and the ideology were patterned on the fascist parties of Europe. Uh, Jamail admired Franco and the fascist party. Um, they have been the, the late president-elect uh, Pierre's son, Bashir, uh, was in a blood feud with another Maronite Christian group led by a man called Frangia. Frangia's son, his granddaughter age two, and a number of their people were murdered in cold blood in their house in the mountains. Everybody believes, though it's hard to prove, by the Jemail group. Um, it was, and potentially is, a country of cutthroat, horrible, communal disputes. And under those circumstances, it is very difficult to make a reasoned judgment of who is to blame for what. But I said at the start, I probably should have tried. Well, that was a pretty good column you just gave us, Tommy. <laughs> Would you comment on the recent admission of the U.S. government that it is actively supporting the overthrow of the Nicaraguan government? Oh, I think that's an overstated question. I don't know if you heard the question. The question was referred to the recent admission of the United States government that it is actively participating in an attempt to overthrow, that's more or less the question, the uh, Nicaraguan government. Uh, there was a newspaper story rather detailed about uh, United States help to efforts coming from Honduras uh, to overthrow uh, the Nicaraguan government. The official United States reaction was of a rather peculiar character, as I recall. They said, well, it isn't such a big effort. It's only a small, it's not. Um, uh, suggesting that it was more of nuisance value than of a serious attempt to overthrow the Sandinist uh, regime. Even taking that at face value, which in fact I do not, I think it's more serious than that. Uh, I think it's a very, very bad idea. I stated earlier, without regard to the ideology of the government, that I'm against the United States participating in attempts to overthrow other, go other governments. I think it's very bad and dangerous, and uh, we know about some of the things that went on with the CIA in the 60s and 70s, and I don't think we should get into that again. 
if only for reasons of self-interest that has a way of rebounding against us. Countries like this one are not very good at conspiracies, it turns out, uh, I'm glad to say. Um, but then in the particular Nicaraguan situation, there are very strong reasons which we can all see for not doing that. Um, the Sandinistas overthrew a really terrible tyranny. The people we are backing, the Somoza tyranny, the people we are backing uh, in, along that border to make incursions and try to overthrow, to the exact extent of which I'm not sure, uh, the Sandinist regime, are the former Somoza National Guardsmen, the very people who were most hated, who were so hated that it became possible to overthrow the government that had been in power for a very long time. So I think it's a question of backing a very poor horse, leaving apart the morality of it. Uh, it also has the effect of making the uh, Sandinist regime inside understandably worse, more anti-American, more tyrannical, worse for human rights in its own country, crueler to the Indians whom it is mistreating, and more suspicious and paranoid in general. Uh, so I think it's a bad policy. This one begins with some applause for you, which I will skip. <laughs> and then it asks, would you say that the inconsistent treatment of US citizens, people within US boundaries, presents in some way a ludicrous political position dealing with atrocity elsewhere while severe poverty, et cetera, exists here. And then second, has there been a decline in human rights here? And what can be the effects here and abroad? If I understand the question, it raises what is really a profound political choice. And my position on this may not be the same as yours, Marvin. It is not the same as many human rights advocates. The choice is this. Do we want to consider economic rights as part of the same uh, basket, the same conception as what we would in, inside this country call civil liberties? That is, um, is the right to a job the same as the right to be free of governmental torture or imprisonment without trial or summary execution. Um, now, there are, as I've suggested, there are many people who think that these economic rights should be uh, considered as part of the same thing. And it is, of course, in a sense, literally true uh, that you don't have many rights if you starve to death. Uh, that is true. And nevertheless, I think it is important, and this is my view, um, for purposes of clarity, to separate the two. And I would myself like to consider human rights as in the civil liberties, civil rights uh, category, and leave the economic questions for separate discussion. Uh, now as to the situation in this country, on that question I think I'm a bit of a patriot. There are plenty of things wrong with this country, and certainly that is true economically today. And there is plenty of injustice and cruelty uh, still on the economic side and on the race side. But I will say that of all the things that have happened in my lifetime, the most heartening, the most remarkable has been the improvement in what could broadly be called the human rights situation in the United States. I know of no parallel for it in the history of mankind. When I was growing up, and long after that, as recently as 20 years ago, more recently even than 20 years ago, it was not possible for a black person to vote for fear of his life in Mississippi and in many places in Alabama, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, South Carolina. It has been totally transformed. In my lifetime, legally enforced seg segregation has been done away with. There are black members of the Mississippi legislature, both houses. Uh, Strom Thurmond has appeals for black votes. 
because he has to, because that's the political system. Now, you may think, looking back on it from today, that that's just some natural development. Well, I want to tell you, it has never happened peacefully anywhere else, to my knowledge, and I think we ought to be proud of it. I join in the applause, Tony, but, but by saying you disagree with me, you right away invite a quibble, <laughs> which I will inject. First, uh, the way I see it, we really don't have to choose between the economic and the other. There is an e international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights, very valuable to a large part of the world's population. There's an international covenant on civil and political rights, the ones you talked about. I think we ought to ratify both. We have ratified neither. As to the other subject, I certainly agree with the things you said about the remarkable history of America in this century. At the same time, uh, one of the great things I think we can contribute on international human rights is domestic human rights. And for example, the Lawyers Committee for International Human Rights, whose executive director may be lurking in this room somewhere, has spent a great deal of energy uh, recently on the problems of Haitian immigrants and their asylum efforts and their uh, ruthless and unjustified imprisonment, things you know about. Uh, those are matters on which uh, human rights advocates may fairly take a leadership position here and press America as a continuing example to the rest of the world. But I am, of course, in complete agreement. I thought so. We always wind up in peace. <laughs> um, this says, if this is a forum on human rights, how do you justify your continuing support of Arab rights, Arab rights, in light of their avowed dedication to the annihilation of the state of Israel and its people? Are they not entitled to human rights? I think the thing that leaps up at me from that question is the they, uh, the first they, their uh, dedication to the annihilation of Israel because that sweeps all Arabs into the same category. And f you heard that, ladies and gentlemen. I think we could not have a more graphic demonstration of what I'm talking about. I would have thought, I would not have believed that I would live to hear a Jew say that any people should all be wiped off the face of the earth. Any people, whoever they were. I think we're. Go I think that we're going to limit. Uh, I think that we're going. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Please sit down. Please sit down. Sit down. I think we're okay. Dr. Stern, please sit. If, if, if. I think. Okay. okay. If, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're. I think we're going to limit Judge Frankel and Mr. Lewis to one or two more questions. All right. We, we've heard from you, sir. Perhaps we can. We can continue to hear from them. Let me try dealing with the questions. It's all you want. You do indeed have the right to be heard. Nothing could please me more than uh, to know that the interjection from over here was not intended to, su to suggest that any group of people should be wiped off the face of the earth. I thought that was what I heard, and I think a lot of other people heard that. My notion in any case is that there are good Arabs and bad Arabs, evil, false, true, 
as there are other people. The history of Israel has been a very painful history of attack by Arab forces, and it is natural that there is a fear and a justified fear. My belief is that the wisest policy for Israel, as a matter of pure self-interest, leave apart any moral questions because maybe such questions in their situation, though they don't think so, uh, we may think that uh, moral niceties uh, are a little hard to follow. They, in fact, do follow them on the whole, as we said earlier. The Israelis. <clears throat> but as a matter of pure self-interest, it is my belief that it is in Israel's interest to try to coax out of the Arab world though the best rather than the worst. I think that one of the great moments for the security of Israel was the decision of President Sadat of Egypt to go to Jerusalem and offer peace as he did. And that was not, note ladies and gentlemen, a week before that. I think there was actually a poll taken, but in any case there had been quite recently, in which 90% of Israelis saw no hope of peace with Egypt, thought the Egyptians were all out to slaughter them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Their opinion changed when Sadat had the courage to come to Jerusalem and do what he did. I think it is, I was about to say that it is less, I don't mind. Sir, if, sir, if, you, can't, if you can't keep quiet, we're going to have to ask you to leave. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you one last time. I only... You've been heard. You've been heard. You, you have been heard. No, it's not coming up on the stage. I think we're going... Should we go on to the next one? Ask, ask him to leave. One or two more. All right. Look, I'm going to I'm going to put one or two more questions to Mr. Lewis, and then we'll adjourn. Uh, it's been a long night for him. Tony, if you can, I don't think this is exactly your main department, but do you believe? I, I, do no, you, there, will, there will not be a rebuttal. No. Do you believe, Tony, that... He had the right to be heard. He had the right. Would you also like to leave? He was heard at some length. <laughs> Let me ask you this question that was put by somebody who was following the rules and sent it up. Do you believe that the United States should leave the UN if Israel should be voted out of the General Assembly? I think the United States should certainly, at a minimum, suspend all participation. I, I put it that way because I would hope that there, uh, well, first of all, I would hope that the very threat would prevent any such thing happening as it has, as it just has. Um, should it come to that, I think we would still, we might still want to keep open some possibility of uh, turning the situation back, and that's why I say not participating, but essentially the utility of the organization would have come to an end. Uh, uh, Mr. Hyman is, is hovering over us, and although well, I'm, I'm content to you've you... only been at work for an hour and 40 minutes, Tony. I'm prepared uh, to go on a little bit if, if we can. <laughs> I think somebody once defined a sadist as somebody who wouldn't hurt a masochist. And Tony's ready to go on and you're all applauding. So, Who am I to resist a room full of sadists? Mr. Lewis, do you consider the freedom to walk city streets in safety a human right? If so, isn't the United States one of the least free industrialized nations of the world? Well, it's a serious question. I think it's a play on words to talk about freedom that way, but believe me, uh, I don't underestimate at all 
I was talking about it with a friend of mine yesterday, the restriction on all of us that, again, I mean, I seem to be talking in sort of old man terms tonight, <clears throat> but um, in my lifetime, I think one of the significant bad changes has been the restriction on all of us with the sense of threat that didn't exist when I was a child, when one could play in Central Park and come to the Y and not worry. Uh, so I don't underestimate that. Um, and I would be, if the questioner suggests uh, that we need measures to, to fight crime, of course I'm in agreement with that. It doesn't follow from that that the way to do it is to suspend our concern for civil liberties, not at all. We have, in various ways, put this kind of question to you, but let me read what the card says, Tony. Why has the majority of the American press been biased in being so sensitive to infringement of PLO rights and not as sensitive to the infringements against Israelis by the PLO? Would you also like to leave? I don't think that... Um, uh, there's any question of infringement. <laughs> Mr. Lewis has answered your questions, and I think you're going to have to leave as well. Marvin, I don't think that there has been. Uh, the questioner referred to PLO rights. Uh, I don't know of any PLO rights, and I don't know of any press uh, concern for PLO rights as such. I think there has been, I think there has been, and remains, and I believe quite rightly, uh, some concern uh, for the rights of those human beings who live in the occupied ter territories and happen to be Palestinians. <clears throat> um, and on this issue, as on all, I think without exception, uh, that relate to such matters within Israel, I follow the lead of Israelis uh, because it is the nature of that country that the, there are voices there, very strong, very articulate voices, who speak out against uh, what might be called, in some general sense, violation of human rights. There's an issue right now, um, a demand that foreigners, many of them American, who teach at universities in the West Bank, should, be ha should have to sign loyalty oaths. <clears throat> the objection the, yes, uh, the, uh, we did it here, and some of us, certainly including me, thought it was a very bad idea. Um, the uh, Supreme Court of the United States has uh, successively held uh, required loyalty oaths for university teachers uh, unconstitutional as a violation of uh, academic freedom, freedom of thought. And Secretary Schultz, who began life or began his uh, adult life, as a very conservative economics professor on a conservative faculty, the University of Chicago, the home of Milton Friedman, um, said in talking about this very issue, the loyalty oath for those uh, teachers at the West Bank universities, said the other day that we had had bitter and unhappy experiences with loyalty oaths for teachers and he did not like to see it repeated. Uh, I agree with that, but my point, I got sidetracked here, my point was to say that the first voices to speak up on that issue were Israeli professors. Gentlemen, notwithstanding your willingness to continue, I think we're going to have to cut you short. I'd like to thank both of you for, for coming tonight, and I'd like to thank uh, all of you for coming tonight, and uh, I hope you found this series in informative. modest excitement, I didn't uh, get a chance to say it, and that is...
Is it back on now? In a minute. Uh, this has nothing whatever to do with the particular subject of this, so if I've excited your interest, please forgive me. It's just a small sentimental touch. <laughs> and that was simply to say that 40 years ago, uh, I used to swim in the swimming pool in this building, and 20 years ago, I used to come to this auditorium and listen to the Budapest Quartet. My mother was a directory, director of the nursery school here for many years, and I want to tell you that I, I just, it has been very important and touching to me to be in this place and to tell you how wonderful I think it is. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.